Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I would like to thank the ICAP, Ms. Kortwal, and the esteemed attendees for permitting me to be presenting the, uh, the presentation on cyber crimes today. So as you've heard from Mr. Shah that there are a lot of threats and they're emerging and there is no end in sight. And this problem is going to fester further and cause more losses and disruptions to the industry. Um, what I wanted to start was with a talk a little bit about how the cost of breach is escalating. As you go back to 2000, as you see by different countries, the, the cost of breach is different. Uh, for example, in Brazil, it's about $1.38 million per incident. But if you come to the United States, it's about $9.44 million. I couldn't find anything uh, about breach expenses in Pakistan. I really wasn't able to determine if there's any statistics available that I could uh, demonstrate today. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that not all threats and all our uh, forensic uh, attacks and breaches are the same. They do tend to differ in their motivations. I have a slide to talk a little bit about motivations of hackers and why do they target certain industries in certain patterns. As Ms. Codewala mentioned, that the, the the losses have been growing as well. And in the last five years, there's been about you know 27 billion reported losses. Now, this is estimated to be one third of the actual losses because a lot of people do not report any incidents from the fear of reputation, regulatory challenges. And if they can mitigate those risks, they tend not to report. There's also consumers when they are hacked and they are swindled for money, they do not report. They just go by their business because it's more of a challenge to report. So th this is going to get further, further more uh, worse because the hackers are now, as uh, Mr. Shah mentioned, been using AI and newer techniques to to propagate attacks faster and in a more organized manner. So where we are seeing as practitioners, the challenges are, the cyber crime is a business problem, not an IT problem. And you may see that in many organizations, uh, the security, cyber security is delegated to a manager or a director or a CIO level resource, where their primary focus is business enablement. So it creates a conflict of interest for them to actually implement controlling technologies, which would hamper the business as opposed to growing the business or enabling the business. So that balance needs to be developed through the board and the CEO to implement a, a, an organization that actually has delegated responsible people who are assign responsibility for cyber crime, for digital forensics, for accounting crimes, and they have impartiality in reporting those issues all the way up to the audit committee or the risk committee of the board so that there is a sense of ownership within an organization to fight and mitigate these crimes. Like I said, the cyber crimes and actors and motivations are slightly different. So we have the biggest threat in many organizations is nation states. Now nation states really do not target organizations where they need to steal money. They're looking to steal intellectual property, trade secret, things that they can use against an organization. So for example, you know, United States had a huge OPM attack from China a few years ago, uh, the Office of uh, Personnel Management of the United States government was hacked and a lot of personnel records were stolen, including the fingerprints and other biographic information of those individuals who worked for the government. Uh, the intent of the uh, nation state that stole those were not to take money, but to be able to utilize that information to now propagate and plan further attacks. As Mr. Shah mentioned, the, the use of AI and blockchain can be used now to build those immutable uh, de and decentralized you know, ledgers to actually utilize that information to falsify identities 
to commit frauds. Then you have cyber criminals. Their motivation strictly is how to uh, you know, steal money from you, from businesses, from individuals, from consumers. It started out with the consumers where PCs would get ransomware, then people would pay $50, $100, whatever they could afford to get their information back. But then the hackers realized that this is a, a big opportunity. So the organized crime actually got into it and now have, just like we have businesses, they have businesses where they train people and they have PNL to make sure that cyber criminals are attacking organizations and gaining access into them, either through exfiltrating money, exfiltrating information, causing business email compromise and diverting funds. So some, so some frauds are very simple. All they have to do is somehow gain access to a legitimate email account and issue an invoice with different payment information on it. And if the business doesn't have accounting processes defined to make sure that payment information will not be changed through an administrative check, for example, call the contact that originally set up the vendor record and speak to the person that had originally provided the banking information so that the, the banking information would not be changed and the money would not be sent to a wrong account. So in principle, it seems very simple. An individual's banking email account is compromised. They use that email account to send an invoice. All they do is just change the banking information and a business can send the payment to the wrong uh, bank and the, the hackers will move that money out of the banking system within hours. And this way, uh, the, the, the businesses lose the money. And most businesses only do reconciliation of funds at the end of the month. So by the time they get to reconciling their payments, they realize that the payment was made to a wrong account. Or if the vendor comes back and says, I wasn't paid, it's been 60 days, I haven't received a payment. And the, the organization goes, no, we did make a payment. And it turns out it made the wrong individual or wrong bank. And by then, no banking system can actually go back and retract that money because it's been so long. And with the use of Bitcoins and other uh, technologies that Mr. Wazan first spoke about, it's very difficult to track and reclaim the money. Then comes another fairly big challenge for organizations inside a threat. Well, inside a threat could be employees, could be contractors, trusted business partners that organizations bring in to provide services. And they can themselves, by gaining more information about the business, start to plan and orchestrate uh, a fraud within an organization. Could be in the tunes of millions, could be stealing intellectual property, trade secrets, money. There are numerous things insiders can do and many organizations typically don't have processes in place to detect insider threat because they're so consumed and worried about cyber crimes that they don't typically focus on the employees because they've hired them, they trust them, they know them, they go to parties with them. You know, there's a whole slew of things that happen within an organization that sometimes leads uh, organizations not to focus on insider threat, but it is becoming more pervasive and it is actually going to cause more money to organizations than the actual the cyber criminals. Then you have your hacktivists, their ideological difference. They want to prove a point. They will attack you. They will disrupt the business. They're not necessarily looking for money, but they're looking to cause reputational harm. They're looking to cause financial harm by loss of trust from your consumers. Terrorist groups, you know, their sole purpose is to gain funding for terrorism activities. And in certain organizations are targeted by them and more so just to gain quick gains of money and then take the money and utilize for other purposes. And then you have the worst kind, the thrill seekers, the aimless people who want to prove a point and get creds from other organizations that they belong to, that they were able to hack into an organization, demonstrate that they were able to do certain things. And now um, the organization had to suffer losses, reputational, regulatory, regulatory challenges. 
the kill chain is what, and I won't spend too much time on it because uh, Mr. Gazanfer very eloquently spoke a bit about it. Every fraud becomes with reconnaissance. They look for executives, they look at their profiles at LinkedIn and other social media. They try to understand how does the organization conduct their business? What is the business model? Using that information, they can try to infiltrate into an organization. They would use email, fraudulent email, phishing. They can look for weakness in systems that are publicly facing. They can look at employees that they can help conduct the insider threat situation. And with that, they gain into figure out a way to get into an organization. And then they weaponize themselves to conduct a fraud or conduct a cyber crime by way of delivering small pieces of software into an organization which can get installed in many computers. And when the time is right, they can execute that and exploit the organization. And then the ransomware starts to propagate. They also, since the piece of software the delivery is so small, can go undetected by many organizations because it's a small piece of system. But they do talk back to the hacker organizations and, and then they receive further instru instructions. And that's how they actually exfiltrate data from accounting systems, from business systems, so that they can now extort money from organizations. They don't not only now do ransomware, but they also tell the organizations, we have your data. We have your trade secrets. We have your customer data. We have your patient data. We have your financial information that may have irregularities that, that the regulators might want to look for. And if we, you don't pay us the money, we will release that data on the dark web. And the dark web has its own levels of um, uh, you know, commerce where certain organizations only barter for certain type of data, right? Some people may look for credit card information. Some people look for intellectual property. Some look for other type of information. But for an organization, in the end, it's losses. Financial losses, reputational losses, regulatory challenges that could result in fines. And so if you look at the regulations, there are a number of regulations that have been enacted by most organizations and countries to combat privacy violations, which result in security challenges. GDPR is probably one of the biggest ones that was introduced in 2016. And the premise of GDPR is that anyone who resides in Europe has the right to privacy and has the right to not be monitored, not be tracked, and whenever they feel like their information should be purged from a system. Uh, so the, the, the essence is to give the right back to an individual. Now the difference in this law is that anyone in Europe, so it doesn't mean it has to be European citizen. A person can just be visiting Europe and at that person becomes a European person. And if their information has been tracked, they can request that information to be uh, purged from the system. What that does is it introduces a whole lot of challenges to the organizations, how to implement processes and policies and systems to be able to effectuate this. Uh, because of the large type of systems that there are, it's difficult to do that and requires a lot of resources, a lot of talent, a lot of commitment from an organization from sustaining those processes. California has introduced the Consumer Privacy Act, which is similarly shaped around GDPR, which gives California people more rights. Securities and Exchange Commission has taken a strong position on cyber crimes along with the cyber uh, other frauds and now requires organizations to report frauds or a cyber incidents within 48 hours and, and have investigators that go out and actually investigate organizations and see if they did proper risk mitigation or the threats that might be in the systems. Then we have Federal Trade Commission in the United States, and Federal Trade Commission really focuses on business practices. And what it looks for is if an organization in their mission says they do certain things and protect certain information, and they do not do that, then the Federal Trade Commission goes after them, sues them, and actually forces them to pay fines 
and penalties because they did not hold up to their uh, end of the bargain of what they actually said they would do to the consumer information. FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, has investigators now that go in, that look at all the AI, blockchain, anything that an organization is doing to make sure that the funds are not being misappropriated. And they can actually shut an organization down, especially banks, where they can act, have a lot more jurisdiction. H health information is also protected through HIPAA in US and other countries have some laws. State in the states in the United States have laws. And also 71% of the countries have actually have introduced or have approved legislation around cybersecurity, privacy, and information governance. 15% uh, of the countries do not have a le legislation today. 5% of the countries do not have data protection regulations. But you can see most of the countries now are introducing regulations, rules, and laws that need to be governed. The challenge now with for multinationals would be how to understand, interpret these regulations, and bake them into your policies and your processes, and be able to demonstrate that you indeed are doing the things that the organizations are requiring. Because now they can ask to be uh, you to be audited by a third party uh, to come in, examine your practices, and actually ask you to uh, fulfill those requirements, or they would either refuse to do business with you or forbid you from doing business in their countries, which could be extremely costly for organizations that have invested heavily in uh, research and development uh, of things. How can this be mitigated? Cyber hygiene is critical, as uh, Mr. Shah mentioned, that you know you need to have security policies, you have to endpoint detection, encryption, mobile security, people who are accessing websites from your businesses need to be controlled. You can lock down online storage, you can lock down malware sites, you can check for any email that is coming into your organization to make sure it's coming from a legitimate source. Uh, it does not have any malware in it. Identity and access management is critical. It's just not about giving users permission to log into the system. It is actually to assess, does the permission you're giving commiserate with the role they have so that they don't have excessive permissions? Is there any separation of responsibility duty within the uh, access management system to make sure an individual does not have the right? A typical example would be, do I have a permission to enter a voucher and approve a check and be paid? Now I could certainly go in and enter a voucher, then I can approve the payment and the payment would be made. But if you have check and balance in, in the system with having more people to approve that, then you have designed a system that can um, you know, sustain that type of a fraud. Data leak protection is critical. Your third parties, anything that you're doing business with, you may be secure, but your third parties may not be. They may not be following the same practices. So if you outsource some fun critical business function, you ought to go and assess their practices to make sure they are doing what they're required to do. Educating the users, informing them, keeping them aware on regular intervals of what the threats are, having a robust business continuity and disaster recovery plan in place. So if you're hit with a large type of a cyber attack, how can you continue to conduct business? Incident response is critical. You need to have an incident response plan. This plan should entail all type of scenarios that you may encounter within an organization. And it's really need to be tailored, tailored towards the type of business your organization runs so that you're not taking someone else's plan and trying to implement it. You need to understand, your, so your cyber people, your security people need to understand your business. What is your business? How do you run the business? What are the workflows? And how the, can those workflows could be compromised and how to recover from them? Collecting log data is critical. Otherwise you cannot do any security analytics or digital forensics because any just similar to how uh, follow the money, here's follow the logs, follow the activities in the system. Most organizations are now outsourcing some of the retainer work. They're hiring organizations to be able to uh, come in and help them recover um, from an incident, whether it's financial incident or a cyber incident. Uh, tabletop exercises, all the way up to involving the board members and CEO, CFOs to come and 
go through a simulated cyber incident can help uh, make them understand what are the mechanics of a cyber incident, how to recover from it. The most critical piece in this uh, cyber tabletop access always include your communications and public relations people, because they are the ones who can craft a message out to the public, out to your customers, out to your business partners as to what's going on. Wrong information disseminated can actually cause more revenue losses and reputational challenges to an organization. Um, and in conclusion, I just wanted to show one uh, slide of how you can actually implement and test your blocking techniques. Here you have some solutions that you can be, that you have implemented into your organization. And you see if, a, if you bring in a third party to attack your organization, they can tell you the number of tests they ran, some of our went undetected, some were logged, some were you were alerted on, and then a number of things were blocked. So an organization should really look for alerted and blocked. How much can I do alerting and how much can I do blocking? Because this is where non-human activity takes place and you can automatically through automation implement those things. Um, board reporting is critical. And I have a small slide uh, to show how you can demonstrate to the board where you are in your organization in implementing a number of controls that are needed. And you can really make it very color coded, very high level, because board members do tend not to be technology centric, they're more business centric, but this can at least show you that you're covering the entire landscape of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, thank you.